the I don't remember them having so a I don't remember them having, having, but any that we don't they have. They had a criminal seismograph down, down. Okay. Enough, but so this, there are essentially two tricks that have been used to create the kind of data you have. They both have their limitations, but this is what we've got. Yeah, the first curious. is a proxy system. Mm -hmm. It depends on picking a variable that you can show nowadays has as strong and hopefully as linear as possible relationship to temperature. Mm. And you, that you have records of, of some kind that extend back to the period you're interested in mm. and for which you have for the same place an, ov an overlapping instrumental record. So you have the records say here, 1600 to 1800. Observation of when Lake B1 Japan freezes over. Observation of when the uh, chrysanthemum uh, uh, blooms in Japan. Uh, when the, great, the wine harvest is in a particular area in France. All these kinds of things can be used as proxies. You also have ones that aren't dependent as much on what people were observing then. Ice cores, for example, where you can go in and measure gas content, slice and how up the these ice tree core rings. and tree measure rings. tree rings. And actually a lot of this was tree ring based. Speleotherms, which are these cave deposits where uh, they, they show a relationship uh, of climate to, to uh, climate. Um, you mean when you say speleotherms, cave deposits, you mean like stalactites and stalactites growing? That's the generic So they would grow term. depending upon the If there's more moisture, if there's more moisture, they drip faster. Those are, those so they would get bigger in a, in a drippier season. That's <laughs> right here. Moderns Corals, lake sediments, they've done boreholes. And there were historical accounts. People obviously weren't saying it was 59 degrees today. Right. But they had, today was a very cold day. It's unseasonably so, warm. It's, so yeah. what you did is you took these statements and you would go through the guy's diaries and lots of diaries, legal records, you name it, all sorts of newspapers. And you would tabulate the words that they use, the phrases they would use to describe the record. And you would look, try to see where you were getting consistencies in time and place as to how it was described. And you would create a qualitative scale for those, which you then converted into a numeric scale. And those numbers, of course, did not have an absolute difference yes. meaning, but as long as you had records going in to overlap with an instrumental record, you could try to correlate the two. Now, <coughs> you, I'm sure by now you've recognized some of the dangers with these different types of proxies. The first is that what you're relying on it's subjective. Could have changed so that the actual relationship you're establishing as the proxy relationship might not have been the same in the 1600s as the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Let's use the example of wine harvest. It was one of the first climate history studies by Leduri. Uh, and the trouble is that when you harvest the grapes, depends on how sweet you want them to be. What kind of grapes so you if have, you yeah. want, if the preference changed from a dry wine ice to a sweet wine, or from ice a laser, sweet yeah. wine to you freeze a dry the wine, it's going to affect the harvest state without regard to that. It's late. late. That late. Without going that. into the right. details, I lived in people have tried various tricks for accounting for these kinds of factors. Now, if I had 10 different climate reconstructions for the 1630s of that had this kind of geographic mapping of Europe available, 
I would have had to, and they were in sharp disagreement, I would have had to look at the nitty gritty of how they did the reconstruction and decide which I thought more was valid. more valid. But if there is only one, then that's what you go with unless it looks completely insane. And so we have the work of Lauterbacher and Zoplocki in Europe and other people elsewhere. And so that's pretty much what I ran with. Um, their work, but the second factor you have to worry about, we can use proxies. There are a lot of proxies that would not work. If a proxy is measuring something where the change works on a decade or multi-decadal basis, then while that may be very useful for understanding climate change properties that are on those scales or on century scale, it's not going to help me figure out whether 1636 was a warmer or colder period than 1637. So I needed to look only at the ones that had an annual or near annual resolution. And that's things like tree rings, for example. Um, and I believe, if I recall correctly, Lutterbacker worked most on a combination of tree rings and documentary evidence with occasional consideration of other stuff. You go to other parts of the world, they liked other things. Like for Af Southern Africa, the speleothermic data is the best data available. You don't have as many trees. If you look up in Greenland, they have even fewer trees. And so it's ice mostly the borehole stuff, the, 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 the ice core stuff, I mean to say. Moss layers. That's right. And so you have these different uh, groups. But that's where I got uh, the monthly data, which I do, uh, don't have. The, the grids are far beyond the ability of Excel to handle. We're talking about 30,000 or so columns and the like uh, when you get for some of the stuff. But I did extract some data for the particular locations of Gradfield and Magnetar. But I ha unfortunately had problems in that the monthly data was all given as anomalies, and they didn't bother to get, well, they stated the reference period, but they didn't bother to give the actual reference numbers, which I then had to reconstruct from other sources. But what, let's take a look. Uh, at some of these graphs, it's, it's always more fun to have a slideshow. Uh, when we dim the light, if we can. Yeah, more work. Yeah, switch the whatever. light off. Yeah. Nobody can prove me wrong. Okay, it was cold last week. Uh, yeah, okay, that's perfect. this is 1630 to 39 average together using the Ludebacker Explorer and running it through uh, Ludebacker data and running it through Climate Explorer for the whole year versus 1990 to 1999. And one thing that I found curious is that except when you look closely, look at the boundary areas, and bear in mind that these are artificial gradations. We're choosing to use a particular color for a particular range of temperatures, and it's really, you know, a more gradual transition. But you can see that it, it's shifting things, but not as dramatically as you might expect. The, as I said, the winter 1635, it was a cold winter, but of the period 1500 to 2004, it ranks using Ulutabaka's data as the 30th coldest winter. It would not, if there would be people who in, alive in 1635 who would remember colder winters than that one and would complain about all the sissies right. uh, at that period. Now we look at December, January, February, uh, which is the winter, December 34 to February 1635. And actually, you can see much more substantial differences in where things are here than you did before. 
you look up and scan Navia, how that dark blue area, uh, which is under minus 15 C is the, the main, uh, how that spread. And look, uh, for example, uh, at northern Germany, how uh, it's the, the gray area, which is uh, minus 3 to plus 3 uh, in 1630, 39 average. And it's the um, 3 to 6 range in the next. So you're seeing shifts more at this time scale. When we go to the spring, we, we see some shifts again, perhaps not quite as dramatic, but look, for example, southwestern Spain. Uh, and then here, we're up to September, October, November, and you really have to search to see any difference at all. Hey, Ivar? Yes. Is there any indication that the Gulf Stream will change course? Conveyor? There, we don't have... I mean, you know, that, that puts most of the heat into Northern Europe. I don't know if anybody... We don't. That there have been studies of the North Atlantic <laughs> Oscillation, yeah. which affects how storms, whether storms head toward Northern Europe or Southern Europe, it affects the steerings of storms. But the trouble is, there's no, no, there's no, no right. good proxy for them to use that I can think of to give them any idea of the Gulf Stream. Even today, our information in the oceans is a lot sparser than our information on land. Um, and now, here, um, yeah. And then I decided to take the coldest and warmest Year. years for a particular season. So there's 1635 winter on the left versus 1630 uh, winter on the right. And you can see some shifting there. Um, the scales are the same, but these scales are not the same as for the earlier set of graphs, which used a different, completely different program. Yes? Maybe I missed what you said. Are, are these the average daily temperatures or the average highs? The average these, uh, well, first of all, we don't have any high or low yeah. temperatures until much later in history, nor do we have a proxy for them. Uh, so they can't be reconstructed at all. So, what so these are, a, are seasonal average temperatures, but they're the results of, uh, for example, think a tree ring. Uh, during the growing season, how they, um, how much growth accumulated. So any particular day, it's going to be affected by temperature, but we don't know which for any given day, the best we're getting is the seasonal so data for the growing season. This is probably your, what's happened with your average growing season life. That's right. Uh, and we do, that, and my guess is that for the winter data, we're looking more at those diaries and the, that kind of evidence because that's outside the growing season. But well, yeah, but even outside the growing season, you can see damage. You know, uh, on certain, lots of tree rings will show that uh, the tree almost died here because the winter was so cold. Exactly. And um, now here where we go to March, April, May, 1635 is again the winter on cold, and this time 